My name is Chris Mathis, and I'm the Chief Commercial Officer at Anabios. It's my pleasure to be the moderator for this webinar. Anabios has been hosting webinars like this uh, since the end of 2019, and we're really excited about the, the speakers today. Uh, good morning to all of you in North America. Good evening uh, if you're in Europe or in Asia, and if you're watching on demand, welcome to this webinar. We're really glad you're here. Uh, there will be time for questions and answers at the end, so you can either write them in. You'll see on the panel there's a drop box for questions. You can write them in at any time during the webinar, and we will get them to the end. There are also some uh, brochures uh, that you can download with more information about antibios assays and tissue samples. And so um, just keep that in mind throughout the webinar. Uh, many of you uh, in the audience know about Antibios already, but for those of you that don't, I can tell you that Antibios is a unique contract research organization based in San Diego. We recover human organs from ethically consented donors and use the tissue or cells to conduct physiological assays in which we can test preclinical compounds for drug discovery projects. And this includes safety pharmacology and safety testing also. We've essentially redefined first in human. And working with antibios is as close as you can get to a clinical trial without actually doing a clinical trial. So shown here is, uh, for those of you in the audience that are with academic research labs, uh, please consider applying for um, antibios' translational research grant. This is the third year we've been doing this program. And uh, you can get more information on our website. The, the deadline is this Friday. Uh, the application process is quite easy. You just uh, paste in an abstract and, and send it to us, and that will be considered for the award. So it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker today. And um, I will tell you that this webinar actually came about from a discussion that Derek and I had at the recent uh, Society of Toxicology meeting in Nashville. And um, we were talking about E14 waivers. And, and um, so he uh, graciously agreed to provide this, this uh, webinar, this presentation. Um, he's gonna set the stage and the foundation for um, just more information about this, what it means, and then Nadja will provide an example from Antibios of a preclinical assay that is uh, perfect for that situation. So Derek is the Vice President of Translational and Quantitative Toxicology at Eli Lilly, where he's worked for more than 10 years. He is also an adjunct professor of pharmacology and toxicology at Indiana University of, uh, School of Medicine as well as an adjunct professor in the Department of Pharmacology and Toxicology at Michigan State University. He's a Safety Pharmacology Society diplomat, and he was president of that society in 2013, which was a very formative year for the comprehensive in vitro pyrrhythmia assay uh, initiative with the FDA. Um, and then he did his PhD in pharmacology at the University of Aberdeen in Scotland. So Derek, without further ado, please take it away. Thanks, Chris, and, and thanks, uh, Anabios, for this opportunity to present today. As Chris mentioned, that, you know, what I'd like to do is really uh, introduce to this audience the new ICH E14 and SMB Q&As, and just to make everybody aware of the, the opportunities that are available for uh, development under these new Q&As for an improved and more efficient uh, way of doing your QTC assessment. This second slide is just a pretty standard disclaimer. Uh, so let's just dive in and, and start thinking about this. This is a story that's a long time in the making. Uh, back in 1992, I, I started my career as a general pharmacologist doing some cardiac electrophysiology. So I was perfectly placed in 1996 when the EMA uh, produced a points to consider document on what to do in, in, with drug-induced cardiac repolarization delay. That was swiftly followed by white papers from the FDA and from Health Canada. So having three regions uh, producing documents all related to the same topic, obviously uh, that led to kind of prime fodder for the ICH process. And, and the ICH process kicked off looking at safety pharmacology in general uh, and the ICHS7A came out in 2000. It took until 2005 before the clinical and non-clinical aspects of 
uh, QT assessment, we're really uh, in, a, in a place where you could have a regulatory guidance. Uh, and so in 2005, E15 and S7B came out, and that's really what I'd call the, the beginning of the TQT e era. Many on the, on the call today may be uh, familiar with that situation and may have been around at the time and, and will have experienced the same disappointment that many of us did, that actually the non-clinical data didn't really seem to have much regulatory impact. A TQT was require, uh, required regardless of the S7B results. So even if they suggested that your, your drug was of low risk, you still ended up doing a TQT. Roll on another decade uh, with constant updates to ICH E14, and there was a Q&A, Q5.1, and that was the concentration QTC uh, question, and that allowed concentration QTC to be an acceptable endpoint for a, a QT assessment, a, a thorough QT assessment. So really, the end of 2015 marks the end of the, the unique TQT era. After some time, there was there's, uh, some discussions about the non-clinical, and, and as Chris alluded to, the SIPA initiative was, was kind of born in, in 2012, so there had been some non-clinical work going on on proarrhythmia assessment. The ICH E14 S7B concept paper was, was approved by the ICH Management Committee in 2019. And then in 2022, we had the ICH E14 S7B Q&As. Uh, and those Q&As really brought and, and ushered in the start of what I'd call the integrated risk assessment era. And that's the era we find ourselves in now. And th those are the opportunities that are now being presented to us. So this is a slide that was presented first by Christine Garnett at a couple of meetings uh, last year. And, and it's quite a, an interesting slide in that it does depict that transformation from the TQT era to the integrated risk assessment era. So back in 2015, the uh, concentration QTC became the allowable endpoint. And you can see from, from these uh, histograms that when the FDA IRT looked at the QT assessment studies they were, they were considering, 62% of them were standalone TQT studies and only 10% were uh, question 5.1 concentration QTC assessments. As you roll on to 2021, five years later, the, the proportions have switched. We're now in a situation where 5.1 was the larger of the two proportions and, and TQT uh, proportion shrinking. We expect that it will continue to shrink and that we'll see very few standalone TQT studies. Now, what you also see in this slide is, is a kind of constant 25 to 30 percent uh, bar for question 6.1. And I'll come on to question 6.1 in a moment. That's, that's the alternative study when a TQT study isn't possible. So what are the options that you now have? So, so there was a time back in 2005 where your only option really was to try and do that TQT study as best you can. And that option is still available to you. So status quo still exists if that's the if that's the best way to address the QT assessment for your development program. But now you can take probably what is the favored option, and that's to conduct concentration QTC analysis in the early clinical studies, such as the single ascending dose first in human study. Uh, and that study, you can use the concentration response modeling. So that's really what's covered in that Q5.1 in the Q&As. So that's probably your best and simplest option from a, cl a clinical perspective. There may be situations, however, where you can't get to two times the high clinical exposure. That high clinical exposure is defined in, in question 5.1 in E14. Uh, but sometimes you may not be able to achieve that in those early clinical studies, in which case you can support your question 5.1 assessment with ICH S7B studies. That's the so-called non-clinical double negative. So you, so you can use a double negative to support the concentration QTC analysis, which at least has achieved high clinical exposure, but not achieved two times the high clinical exposure. 
There's also the, the alternative study option. So that's option four here. So this is you a study where you would try and include as many elements of either a standalone TQT study or the concentration QTC assessment as possible, but you may not be able to include them all. The way to think about this may be situations where you can't test the molecule in, in healthy volunteers, or there are limitations where you can only really uh, reach modest concentrations because of, of tolerability. So those are the these situations that are covered by Q6.1 and E14, which is the cases where a conventional TQT study is just not feasible. Now you can you can do what you can and you you can uh, put forward your QTC assessment. What has normally happened is that the label that that has arrived at for, for those situations uh, for compounds states something along the lines of there was no QTC change bigger than 20 milliseconds or we could probably rule out that there was a QTC change bigger than 20 milliseconds. The new Q&A Q A's offer the possibility that if you support 6.1 with a, an ICHS7B study double negative you may get to the situation where you could have a label that suggests low risk if in, in actual fact your clinical and your non-clinical data are all pointing at a low risk situation. So to, to kind of lay out those options more in the form of a decision tree, that, that's what's shown here. So your first real question is, can I study the QTC in healthy subjects? If the answer is yes, then, then you're moving to the left-hand side of this slide. And then your next question will be, can I, can I achieve two times the high clinical scenario or high clinical exposure? If you can, then, then you can support your QTC assessment without any clinical data, uh, and you're likely then to arrive with a label that says no QTC effect. And that scenario is really going to, the experience says that that happens in about 50% of cases, you can find yourself in, in that situation. If the answer to the first question, can I study in healthy volunteers, is no, then, then you're moving across to the right-hand side of this slide and you're, you're falling into question 6.1. If you do do as many of the things that you can in that study uh, and you manage to exclude a clinical QTC signal, then your, your label may reflect that there's, there's unlikely to be a QTC effect bigger than 20 milliseconds. You can use the ICHS7B double negative in the two scenarios that kind of fall in the middle of this uh, slide, so where you didn't get to two times the high clinical exposure or where you want to support your Q6.1 study, your clinical study, with some extra non-clinical data. If the non-clinical data supports a double negative, then you can arrive in the situation with the, uh, with the label of no QTC effect. So those are kind of the pathways and the decisions that you can follow given the new Q&As. So the first thing that we, we should note is that for most of the double negative, we're still very much anchoring on QTC. So, so a lot of people would like to see us move from QTC to, to TDP, to the, the actual risk of prorhythmia. Uh, the Q&As are, are still fairly firmly anchored uh, on the hazard identification, at least for the, the integrated risk assessment and the non-clinical double negative that I'll be talking about. There are uh, details in the Q&As regarding what to do if you don't have a double negative and therefore when you're finding yourself in the situation of having moved past hazard identification and doing the uh, full-blown risk assessment. So for the double negative we're really in a situation where we're looking at the hazard identification and QT and, and the important thing is that the new Q&As, they lay out the best practice, which is really focusing on the quality and conduct of the HERG and the in vivo study. And those are providing a high quality numerator for margin calculations. But of course, a, a margin calculation needs both a numerator and a denominator. The clinical concentration assessment that we've that uh, we've been doing the concentration QTC has at least provided us with a good understanding of the exposures that are associated with 10 milliseconds of QTC change for some key reference agents and a, and a few test 
articles. Uh, and the ICH and, and FDA found that uh, there was sufficient data available to provide critical concentrations for three molecules, Defertilide, which has slow hair blocking kinetics, Moxifloxacin, which of course is probably the most studied QTC drug ever, and Ondansetron. And Dantrotron is an example of a compound with fast hair kinetics. So those are the three uh, reference agents, and th those three critical concentrations uh, inform us of, of what can be the denominator for the margin for those three molecules, and can also inform the in vivo study for margin calculations for those three uh, molecules. Of course, for your test article, the high clinical exposure is the margin denominator. For your test article. So one of the things that, that has uh, given some people uh, some difficulties with the new Q&As is that we're no longer looking at just a, a point estimate of the margin where you use the, the mean HERG IC50, the mean drug concentration and the mean fraction unbound. The, uh, the HERG margin calculation calls for using both the mean and some measure of variability, usually standard deviation, to, to build a distribution of HERG IC50s, of plausible HERG IC50s. The same is done for the, uh, the drug concentration using the mean and variability measure and for the fraction unbound. And what I've got here in these graphs here is just a sample of 500 samples uh, based on the mean and standard deviations for the three components to the margin. And when you do that, you can, you can again, then sample 500 times and make 500 calculations of the margin, and you end up with the distribution on the right. So you can see that that's a distribution that's centered on a margin of around 20, uh, with some spread to either side of 20. This is actually a calculation based on the data for moxifloxacin. So this is the moxifloxacin margin distribution. Margin distributions were, were calculated for defetalide, moxifloxacin, and uh, ondansetron. And then a meta-analysis was used to put all those three together to come up with a single margin distribution for the reference agents. Your test article, you'd go through the same exercise of creating a, a margin distribution for your, your test article. And then your HERG negative is where your lower bound of your test article margin distribution is greater than the upper bound of the reference compound distribution. And in the FDA training material and the ICH training material that's available on the web, the upper bound for the example data there is, is a margin of 51 for the reference agents. So you're really looking for your lower bound of your uh, test article and margin distribution to exceed 51 fold. So what the ICH SFB Q&As provide for in vitro assays is, uh, is some discussion of best practice around things such as the uh, recording temperature, because temperature can affect the results in an unpredictable way, the voltage protocol for patch clamp studies, and also concentration verification, making sure that you actually tested what you thought you tested. There's also other elements that are in those best practices just to make the quality transparent in the study report so that you can reduce the, uh, the review burden for all concerned. Uh, there's also some information on the use of two concentrations of a positive control to allow a better assessment of the relative potency of the positive control. All too often, a, a single high concentration of a positive co control was used, and that wasn't really ne necessarily so very helpful in, in helping estimate the potency or the relative potency of the, the test article. Uh, and obviously, the comparison is to reference compounds recorded under the same experimental conditions. So this is all related to the HERG margin, but actually, these are general principles that if you're following any in vitro assay, that, that these could be equally applicable, uh, or many of them are equally applicable to any of the in vitro assays that you may use to support your QTC assessment. Uh, and obviously, if a sponsor wants to use a particularly unique protocol, then, then again, they have to provide the, the reference compound information under those same conditions so that some assessment can be made. 
the in vivo situation is another one which is a, which is a little different. So, so we're really not talking about leveraging a single threshold. We were strongly discouraged from coming up with a single threshold number of milliseconds, uh, given how how controversial and, and how much discussion that's led to in the clinical world and the 10 milliseconds in the E14 guidance. There, there was some flexibility offered in the new Q&As. And the pictures here are taken from a, a recent paper from uh, 2023 from Vargas et al. And then these just kind of illustrate the evolving situation. Back when we had ICH, S7A and S7B, there was no real description of what your minimal detectable difference should be, the sensitivity of your assay. There wasn't even an explicit description of what the tested uh, exposure should be in your in vivo assay, but there was generally encouragement to test the clinical exposure and some multiple of the clinical exposure. So, so really, it was a it was a bit of a blank playing field in the uh, in the original S7A and S7B. When we looked at the information that was around and looked at the current state of the assays that were being done, we surveyed our colleagues and discovered that. Uh, about 65% of them said their studies could detect 10 milliseconds or less. Uh, about 82%, it was 20 milliseconds or less. And then there was 18% where uh, it was some value bigger than 20 milliseconds, or they, they didn't know the answer. They, they didn't know the explicit detectable difference. We also looked at some publications that, that described the tested concentrations in safety pharmacology studies. And it turned out that about 90% of studies tested multiples between one and 100 fold the clinical exposure. Where we've arrived at with E14 and S7B q and A's, it's really that you can leverage the, a, an algorithm that, that relates the minimal detectable difference to the uh, clinical exposure multiple. And so you see an example line here that passes through a point of at 10 milliseconds and 3x clinical exposure. And those numbers uh, tally with some information that's in the training material. But really, you're looking for your study to have properties that are to the right of that sloping line. So if you could detect 10 milliseconds and you tested a 10x multiple, then that and you you had no effect. Well, that would be a negative. But equally, if you tested 20 milli, your study had a 20 millisecond minimal detectable difference, and you tested 10 to 30 fold the clinical exposure, that study would still reassure you that there was no clinical uh, or there was no QTC effect observable, and you could carry that information forward into your risk assessment. So really, you've got the ability to use studies with a relatively modest minimal detectable difference, but the, you can leverage the fact that the exposures tested were higher than clinical. And that's an advantage that we often have with the in vivo studies. So that, that was how you describe a QT negative, or how you discover that whether or not you've got an in vivo negative. Now, what we have realized, of course, is that we couldn't cover all bases with the situations we had, and there are some emergent gaps. One of the, the key gaps is that question 6.1 and question 5.1, the non-clinical double negative really comes up in situations where the human tolerability uh, is limited. And, and so you can't get to 2x the high clinical exposure, or you can't do a, a study in healthy volunteers because you have those limiting tolerability issues. Now, those tolerability issues for man can also occur in animals. So you can find yourself with some of the same limitations in your, your in vivo study. Additionally, and for right now, we're in this period of catch up where people are, are trying to apply for TQT waivers on studies that they did some time ago. And when you go back and you reflect on the in vivo study, it could be that it had a rather poor detectable threshold or limited exposures tested. So you're not quite sure or you can't quite make the, uh, the assessment of whether or not it was negative according to the double negative assessment. And then both in the clinical and, and non-clinical world, there are those situations where heart rate effects can make it quite challenging to do the in vivo assessment. So if you have a drug with a very strong heart rate effect, that may be one where your, your in vivo study becomes difficult and it becomes difficult to say whether or not you've got an in vivo negative. 
So to bridge that gap, uh, I think there's very little interest, just given the, the appropriate three hours focus, there's very little interest in going back and doing uh, more intense, uh, perhaps anesthetized in vivo studies and or using an ex vivo tissue study as an extra assay to break the uh, break the deadlock and, and bridge the gap. So there's a preference for an in vitro human cell or tissue that's that's more integrative than than a simple ion channel assay, which are also done obviously with human ion channels. But the uh, so something maybe like an action potential duration could be used to support and, and bridge this gap. So it's not explicitly there in the uh, in the Q&As, but it is described that, that you can use additional assays. And there's principles that are given in ICHS 7B questions too, which cover the in vitro assays and, and cardiomyocytes in particular, and also question four, which covers the principles of proarrhythmia models. There are principles in both questions which can be used to support an in vitro assay. So then you have the ability to detect, uh, as long as you have the ability to detect the effects of the three reference agents at the critical concentrations, I think you can make a case that you've got an assay that can be used in this kind of a, an assessment. So that's kind of taking me to my last slide. Uh, and really, I just want to emphasize, and I hope, hope that I've managed to show the ICH E14 and S7B Q&As offer some efficient options to test for the risk of QT prolongation. We can define the margins in vitro and in vivo for key reference agents, and it's possible to define a negative response in vitro and in vivo on the basis of those margins or the multiple of, of the clinical high exposure. You could actually have a positive in either your HERG or your in vivo study but if it's beyond the, uh, you know, an appropriate margin, then actually you could still regard it as negative. So it's kind of a, a conundrum in that sense that you can actually turn a positive into a negative on the basis of margin. Uh, and then the, I think there's also a realization that you can use an in vitro integrative assay where you need to, to be useful where there's toleration or heart rate limiting effects that have really impacted your in vivo studies. So with that, I'll, I'll stop there and hand over the floor to Naja. Thanks, Derek, for a uh, really a great introduction and update on uh, what's going on with uh, S7B and, and uh, E14. So um, we will do questions at the end. So um, please stick around for that. Again, you can write your question in. Uh, anytime during the webinar broadcast and um, later on you can also raise your hand and if you just want to ask your question uh, verbally then I'll unmute you. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, my colleague Dr. Naja Abijerjes who's the VP of R&D at Anabios. He's been at the company for over eight years. Uh, he joined Anabios following 15 years of drug discovery research at AstraZeneca. He holds a PhD in, in cardiac physiology and has been involved in drug discovery programs for the last 23 years, focusing on the cardiac safety implications of drugs and development of novel cardiovascular therapies. His research effort has resulted in um, at least 56 peer-reviewed articles, and he currently serves as editor of Frontiers in Physio Physiology, the Cardiac Electrophysiology section, and Journal of Pharmacological and Toxicological Methods. And by the way, um, Naja was co-chair of the Ion Channel working group of the SEPA initiative. So as you can see here, the title of his presentation today is Ex Vivo Human Ventricular Action Potential Model for QT Prolongation Risk Assessment. Thanks, Naja. Yeah, th thank you, Chris, uh, for, for, for the introduction. And hello, everyone. I would like first to start my presentation by saying that I have known Derek since uh, 2002. And it has been always a great learning experience every time, you know, uh, Derek and I had the chance to discuss. So, uh, Derek, thank you. Thank you for that. With the next 15 minutes, 10 minutes I have, I will present you the Anabias human ventricular action potential model that can help bridging the emerging gaps, you know, of Q61 uh, and the Q51. Uh, let me move the slide. Yeah, Anabias has uh, developed advanced method, you know, to procure high quality human uh, tissues. Uh, 
And one of the organs uh, we recover is the human heart. This allows uh, to study drug effect in human heart tissue to first identify cardiotoxicity risk of novel drugs, and secondly, to define accurate safety margin, and finally, to help selecting those for first in human studies. The models we developed to support the drug discovery programs, as you can see, are cell-based and tissue-based models. One of the tissue-based models is the human ventricular action potential model. To use this, uh, the use of this integrative model uh, would help to answer an important uh, requirement from regulators. Does a novel drug have the potential to cause a QT prolongation? The model is well validated. Uh, we published the data with 18 reference drugs, and also we have unpublished data with additional 15 drugs. Uh, the model is associated with low uh, inter- and intra-donor variability, is around 7% variability, and the sample size uh, of four tissues per drug is required to detect the drug effects. This slide summarizes uh, to you how the tissues are processed and how the action potential uh, signals are measured. As you can see, upon arrival to the lab, the heart is perfused with cardioplegic uh, solution, Next, uh, the ventricular trabecula uh, are dissected and allowed to stabilize. And finally, action potential signals uh, are recorded with a sharp electrode technique. It's important to mention that Anabios has multiple rigs for uh, action potential measurement. This maximizes the use of hearts and tissues and ensures the testing of many uh, compounds uh, per heart. As you can see on this slide, for sequential application of uh, the vehicle, uh, DMSO 01%, uh, and we use it here to mimic an experiment with a drug, did not affect action potential duration and did not cause manifestation of proarrhythmia markers. So the conclusion here is that the action potential recording are stable over time and can be used to assess the potential of drugs to prolong the QT interval. As you can see on the right-hand side of this slide, the activity threshold of the model in relation to different parameters uh, were determined. Derek, in his presentation, mentioned three key reference drugs. Uh, uh, as you heard from him, these drugs are dofetilide, moxifloxacin, and ondansetron. Note that we compared in, uh, in this presentation the action potential data to this drugs, therapeutic free CMAX and HERG IC50 values as they were reported in the ICH E14 S7B Q&A supplemental files. As you can see on this slide, we are showing the data with dofetilide. Uh, we are showing uh, representative action potential traces in the presence of the vehicle and in the presence of three ascending concentration of uh, dofetilide. Also, the slide shows the percentage change in APD90 when compared to vehicle in response to different concentration and to multiple of uh, therapeutic free CMAX. Data indicate, as you can see on this slide, that dofetilide prolonged the action potential and increase in APD90 was seen around and above the critical clinical concentration associated with the 10 milliseconds QTC prolongation. Next slide shows you the data with moxifloxacin, here tested at four ascending concentration. Similar to dofetilide, moxifloxacin prolonged the action potential, and again, increase in APD90 uh, caused by moxifloxacin was seen around and above the critical clinical concentration that gives the 10 milliseconds QT prolongation. This slide show, shows you the data we obtained with ondansetron when tested at four ascending concentration. Similar to dofetilide and moxifloxacin, ondansetron prolonged the action potential in a concentration-dependent manner, and uh, again, increase in APD90 was seen around and above the HERG margin. If made available, clinical data with ondansetron will allow us to verify if an increase in APD90 will be seen uh, around and above uh, against the critical concentration uh, for the QT for the 10 milliseconds QT prolongation. Of course, in addition to the action potential duration assessment, uh, 
The model can assess the potential of drugs to cause the manifestation of proarrhythmia markers. Here in this slide, we present the effect of the three drugs on triangulation. And triangulation, as you know, is one of the proarrhythmia markers that can be derived from, from this action potential model. Note that the triangulation is calculated as APD90 minus APD30. As you can see on this slide, data demonstrates that dofetilide, moxifloxacin, and ondansetron increase the triangulation. And like with the action potential duration data, the increase in triangulation was seen around and above the HERG margin. In collaboration with the FDA, a new data from this action potential model will be presented at this year's Safety Pharmacology Society meeting. So if you, at, if you and your colleagues are attending, please visit the poster for further discussion about uh, this action potential model and how uh, it can be used to improve translation between non-clinical and clinical uh, data. In conclusion, the action potential model we developed at Anabias provides an integrative translational assay assisting in the detection of novel drugs that have the potential to prolong the QT interval. And finally, the model's uh, action potential uh, duration data can be used to bridge the QC1 and uh, Q51 gaps of the ICH E14, S7B, Q and A's. And thank you, thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Nadja, for the excellent presentation. We have plenty of time for questions, and um, I see some of you are writing questions in. Uh, that's excellent. Um, again, you can also just simply raise your hand in the box there, and I'll unmute you. So, um, and then as a reminder, you can download some of the antibios brochures in the handout section. So uh, there you go. So I'll start, uh, Nadja, I have a question for you. You know, obviously that um, heart tissue action potential assay you're talking about is not just for E14 waivers. Um, can you describe situations that antibios uh, clients use this assay, like at what stage in the process? I think you're on mute, Nadja. Let's get, get you back there. There you go. Go ahead, Nadja. Yeah, basically the clients uh, and the discovery programs, you know, they use the model uh, uh, to assess the effect of a compound on action potential. And usually this is done uh, at the late preclinical development stages, uh, you know, before uh, uh, committing to, uh, uh, to in vivo uh, cardiovascular study and toxicology study. Of course, you know, the model is also being used to as a follow-up studies to support uh, programs that they are already in, in a clinical testing. But uh, again, you know, the model can be used throughout the different phases of, uh, of uh, the drug discovery progress. So it can be used uh, early and later preclinical development and also can be used to support the clinical development of compounds. Excellent, thanks. So here's a question from the audience for Derek. It's from Mark Holbrook. He says, nice presentation. Do we have enough HERG data with Moxie, Defetilide, and Ondansetron using the new best practices to show if the margin has changed compared with the old HERG assay practices? For Moxie, you showed it to be around 20 with a large spread. So, so Mark, that's, that's a great question. Uh, I, I can tell you that we have, we have conducted a an assay with those three molecules, and I know some other people have. The numbers are slightly different from what's in the training material, but not substantially. And actually, moxifloxacin tends to land in more or less the same place. Uh, I think our potency shifted by a little. Our potency for defetilide is almost identical to what was in the uh, in the training material, and there's there was some slight movement in some of the uh, the ondansetron data. I mean, on Danstron, in my experience with that fast kinetics is the one where I've seen bigger differences between different assays. Uh, I, I can also tell you that, I, you know, I, I know that uh, some others have used pretty much this exactly the same protocols as we've used them, got pretty much the same number. So in that sense, we're confirming that reproducibility. And I, and I do know that the FDA have gone through an exercise of running assays at different labs with the same molecules to try and uh, 
test to see how uh, you know consistent they are and so that we can get a better answer to the variability question. So there's a lot of emerging data that will emerge uh, in a similar vein, the margins to the in vivo uh, change and that picture that I showed of minimal detectable differences versus the, uh, the, the human exposure tested, that line that's on there was kind of our best guess from some of the data that was available in the literature. Now that we've got a much stronger focus on addressing the, the double negative, there's a number of uh, prospective studies that were also mentioned in that Vargas et al paper. And as those prospective studies start to feed out some information, I think we'll get some more solid data on what that line on that graph should actually look like. And it's slightly different for dogs and monkeys. Thanks, Derek. Here's a question from David Gallagher. MDD is presumably defined with certain super interval analysis, and this would not be a one size fits all. For example, non long acting compounds with small T1 half. I presume the testing sites need to demonstrate this for the specific designs? Uh, absolutely. So, so, David, you're absolutely correct that the, the minimum detectable threshold is, in, is tied to both the experimental design and the statistical model used. So obviously, if, you, if you're using a very unique uh, super interval, then, then you would need to understand what the detectable thresholds were there. Uh, maybe I, I can digress a little bit too and, and say that what you'll get for your actual study is likely to be the, the least significant difference. So that's a Fisher's least significant difference test. So that, that tells you the, uh, the, con the smallest uh, change where you have a 50-50, a 50% probability of detecting it as statistically significant. MDD, uh, as statisticians would know it, usually refers to an 80% power for prospectively designing studies. So that's where you have some historical understanding of the performance of your assay. So you'd need to have that design and that statistical model in several studies. Uh, each uh, would provide some measure of the, the, the uh, root mean squared error and that root mean squared error is what feeds the calculation of minimum detectable threshold. And the elite Fisher's least significant difference is a 50% power uh, calculation. The minimum detectable difference that's used for prospectively designing studies is usually 80% power, so, so slightly different. Thanks, Derek. Uh, here's a question for Nadja from the audience. For the ex vivo ventricular tissue AP model, how do you think of uh, about unbound concentrations, that is the contribution of the nonspecific binding to tissue to arrive at what would be somewhat equivalent to, to an in vivo unbound concentration. Do you do bioanalysis on effluent or is there other preferred methods? Yeah, basically in, in the model, you know, we, we test uh, the, the free unbound concentration and uh, there is no there is no serum, you know, in, in any of the media we, we, uh, we use. So the second part of the question, yes. Yes, as um, do you do bioanalysis on effluent yes. or is there other methods? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's possible, you know, to collect uh, perfusate sample, you know, uh, upon formulation of uh, of a concentration, and after the application of the concentration, you can get a perfusate sample. You can do the analysis and, of course, uh, uh, compare uh, and. Uh, you know, determine the real concentrations that uh, was seen by, by the tissue during the action potential recording. Excellent, thanks. Here's another question from the audience for Nadja. Do you have any examples where the human tissue is different, for example, better than uh, uh, human IPSC for clinical predictions, qualitatively or quantitatively? Yeah, we, we have already, you know, published uh, data comparing uh, the human IPS data versus uh, the data you get from either uh, uh, the human myocyte or the human tissue you get from the adult heart. And uh, yes, you know, the, you can see some, some difference, uh, some left shift of the response. Uh, and sometimes you can see a right shift of the response where you, um, you better get a better, uh, a better safety margin if you want. Yeah, and actually, if you go to our website, we do have a, a page that has a comparison with all that data. And uh, as Nadja said, those are published, so you can check that out. Um, here's a question for Derek. Um, what do the Q&A say regarding the duration of exposure? 
especially in regard to compounds that might act on trafficking compared to direct block. Yeah, so so the, it is mentioned in the uh, in the Q and A's. I mean, hysteresis is a question that comes up in the uh, E14 uh, as well, and and checking to make sure that you've not got an effect that's uh, that's obviously on some sort of different time course from your uh, from your pharmacokinetic and and toxicokinetic exposure. So, so it is mentioned. Uh, it's not explicit in the the sense of uh, the traffic, the trafficking situation, and and uh, of course very long delays. Some of that information, uh, you know, I think nowadays we're we're also getting used to uh, things like siRNAs and what we should be doing for those. So we're we're back to revisiting some of those questions again, and what some of the time course and and studies should look like. You, you obviously, you should you know design your study with the best information that you've got in terms of what you suspect will happen. But you should be paying attention and making sure that there is no obvious hysteresis with a delayed effect. So here's a question that uh, kind of gets to one of the issues uh, from the SEPA initiative uh, from Mark Bryant in the audience for Derek. How do you cope with compounds that have ERG activity, for example, above threshold, but are low risk due to their voltage-gated calcium channel activity? It's obviously not a not a double negative, but it has a low prorhythmic risk due to the dual action. Yeah. So so you know so this is a question that's come up often since we uh, since we produced the Q and A's. If you go back to the concept paper for the Q and A's, that it talks there about stage one and stage two. So the stage one Q and A's were uh, really focused on this double negative question and really making hazard identification efficient. So how could, we, we suspected that most compounds would have a low risk of QT prolongation. So how could we most efficiently and effectively get to that low hazard, uh, hazard ID uh, assessment? And, and so that's what the stage one Q&As were, were about. However, in that stage one Q&As, we did take the opportunity to put in a couple of pieces that which were kind of stage two. Stage two was intended to look at some situations like the risk assessment that, that Mark's asking about. There are some Q and A's already in there on that. So so they there are Q and A's on doing my sites and really some general information on on how you should be thinking about in vitro assays, uh, and that's in the question two point uh, two onwards. And then there's also question four. And question four with its sub questions is really about the principles for a proarrhythmia model. And so, so if people find themselves in that situation where, uh, as Mark described it, you, you, you're not a double negative because you've, you've had either some QT prolongation or some herd block that's, that doesn't have a sufficient margin, or you may have both, but you, you may still be making the assertion that it's low risk because of some other ion channel activities. Well, if you follow the principles in question four with a model, and the, and the SIPA model would generally follow those principles, then then you could make the assertion that it's a that it's a double negative. I think the other thing for the audience to bear in mind, of course, is that you know even the uh, Q6.1 where ICH talks about having a label with no or low risk, uh, we should be aware that ICH generally does not delve into label issues. Those are usually left to the individual regulatory agencies around the world. Uh, and, and ICH doesn't normally go there. So, and I, and I think, you know, just based on my experience, that we'll find that any compound with a proarrhythmia risk assessment will always be a registration discussion. You know, it won't be resolved and, and you, won't, uh, you won't know the answer until you present all of the data to the agencies at the end of uh, phase three and you're, you're seeking registration approval. So there, there'll, all, there'll have to be an ongoing discussion. And, and I think if anybody wants to come forward with a prorhythmia uh, type assessment and, and with a molecule that's low risk, I think that, that it'd be appropriate to have discussions as early as they can with the regulatory agencies to keep everybody on the same page about which models are being used and, and what you can and cannot conclude from those models. Thanks, Derek. Uh, 
here's a great question for Nadja about um, uh, donor to donor variability. So Nadja, the action potential duration prolongation is taken from one preparation. How does response vary from one prep to another and how do you account for population variability? Yeah, when when we when we published the data for the inter and intra donor variability, you know, we we tested the uh, uh, the five compound we published in the, in the paper, you know, on uh, on uh, tissues that were derived from uh, five donors, and uh, we tested also uh, three tissues per, uh, per 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 every donor heart. So we we did a very detailed analysis of uh, of donor to donor uh, variability, and uh, as I indicated, you know the variability is is really low, and uh, based on this data, we um, you know we uh, we test a compound, uh, as I said, you know for for, for tissue from uh, from at least two donor hearts. And you know we we have tested dofetilide uh, over the years, you know, in many many studies, and uh, we see always a very good uh, reproducibility when it comes to dofetilide response. Thanks, Nadja. Here's a question for Derek. Uh, Derek, you mentioned little appetite to retest older registered compounds with GLP HERG or in vivo studies. Does this also hold true if the older compound is being progressed or re-registered for a new indication? I, you know, that's a great question. I, you know, I think, uh, you know, I, I think there would be a preference to rely on as much of the old data as you can, and then think very uh, seriously about whether or not another study was was absolutely necessary. I think the the thing keeping most people away from in vivo studies, of course, is is the three R. Uh, considerations, the hair assays. I, I have seen those repeated, and I've also seen requests that, to have those assays repeated. Uh, if there's any question about how they stack up relative to the the best practice, there's also if you look at the forms that are available, uh, and just as a, a plug to go, uh, pull the slides for this from the. Uh, Anabios site, I'm sure the slides will be available. I put two extra slides in about extra information that was available. If you do go and pull some of the information that's available on the ICH site uh, and, and on the FDA's site on terms of forms to fill in to seek waivers, you'll see that you can go for a mitigation. You know, you may not match all of the criteria of the best practice. Uh, assays but you, there are certain mitigations i mean i think the the obvious one is if you've got a very very large margin with the hair assay that you did i think you could probably make a pretty reasonable argument that you know there's nothing in the best practice guidelines that would shrink that margin dramatically to the point where it, it would become a problem uh, so so there are some mitigations so that you may actually not find yourself repeating any assay but, the, but you know, as I kind of alluded to in the talk, we, we do acknowledge that there, there is a gap and the preference would be to try and avoid in vivo studies if you can. Indeed, and antibiotics can help with that in the assay that Nadja described. So Derek, I have a, a comment and a question for you that puts you on the spot a little bit, but um, you know, at the beginning of your presentation, you talked about, you know, kind of the birth of the herd guidance in the late 90s, and it took, you know, several years until 2005 where S7B and E15 and E14 came about. That seemed like a long time, but you know, SEPA initiative was announced in 2012, and it's it's been over 10 years now. That seems like a really long time, and there's lots of nuances that you describe in your presentation. But you know, in your opinion, do you think SEPA has been successful as an initiative to to kind of spark the changes that it was intended to to change? It's a very interesting question, Chris. You know, I think there was a, there were a number of us who who were involved, who who wondered at the time because you know I think it was very obvious that you could avoid the SIPA path if you just avoided HERC. And many companies right. for a long time, from the late nineties through to two thousand twelve, had had formed very sophisticated uh, processes just to avoid HERC. So, mm -hmm. so the question was, would they reverse that trend and go back, or were the, the missing compounds by doing that that you know that they, that could be good drugs, uh, but with chemical properties that made uh, 
avoiding her kind of difficult. So, so I mean, it was an interesting question. I don't know that there's been a, a huge number of compounds have gone forward to the agency. I don't think there's been as many as the agencies, the regulatory agencies might have expected. As I say, most of the large companies were already in a very strong avoid HERG uh, right. approach. So it was only ever going to be a smaller number of, of compounds. And my personal view, I mean, I, I struggle with the notion of it coming to anything strongly in an ICH document, just because, as I say, I think a proarrhythmia assessment will be very much a registration question an ICH doesn't normally go there, but the, what's already in the Q&As now, I mean, quite, question four in the existing S7B Q&As covers the SIPA model. So the principles that the SIPA model was built on are encapsulated in that question four. So, it's, so there are some instructions about how to go forward should you choose to. It puts an awful lot of emphasis on the sponsor that wants to do it though. Right. Right. Well, it's certainly interesting how, how it's evolved and um, really appreciate the synthesis you provided. And, and also it's interesting with the, with the three R's that you mentioned and the, the FDA's uh, Modernization Act 2.0 to reduce the number of animals. It, it certainly uh, has made this interesting. So um, we're getting close to the top of the hour. Thanks again for everyone who participated and stayed for the interesting Q&A session. Um, be on the lookout for the next Antibios webinar. And thank you, everyone. Thanks, Derek. Thanks, Nadja, for the great presentations. And uh, thanks, everyone, for attending. Thank you.